Hey everybody, and welcome to a special episode of the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast. As you can tell, it's a bit uh, different group here. Just myself with a special guest, Jeff Kabush. How you doing, man? Good. Thanks for having me, Jonathan. Cool. I'll have you just lean closer to the microphone, and then we'll get some good audio. So everyone that's joining us now, you're joining us just for the live stream part, and then we kind of like we'll kind of stop and I'll do like a, a proper intro to the podcast, so then people okay. can can uh, get that once they get just that part that part of the file, but. Uh, yeah, it's good to have you guys with us. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're going to be talking about all things really bikes because uh, Jeff is a three-time Olympian, 15-time national champion from Canada. Uh, you've won BC Bike Race twice or three yeah, times? Yeah, a couple times and then once with Pendrel in the mixed category too. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and plenty of other, uh, any other, or of other race wins and accolades to his name. Uh, you raced for a Getty. Uh, you raced for a uh, Shimano, you race for Garneau, Maxis, Oakley, any other brands that you race for? Yeah, I mean, a bunch of partners I'm lucky to work with, probably 12 or 15 now. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, Yeti, Maxis, Shimano, Fox, uh, WD-40, I mean, yeah, list stages. goes on. Stages, stages power is, uh, Yeah, for sure. Lizard skins and grips and uh, Stan Snow tubes. Cool. Cool. Um, the whole group. Well, lucky to have, yeah, a bunch of supporters. Awesome. Uh, so you spend, and, and before I guess, uh, before we get into, I guess, the, the actual conversation part, uh, just so you know, we've taken a bunch of the questions that you submitted through the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast Facebook group already, and we've kind of built up a list of questions, but feel free to chime in and throw in those questions now uh, into Facebook and YouTube, and uh, we'll be able to go through those. And if we have any spare time at the end, we'll kind of just address those ones ad hoc. Um, but just the same, thanks for joining us. And I guess with that, we'll kick off the proper podcast. So I'll just lay in the proper intro. Welcome to the podcast. It's dedicated to making you a faster cyclist, the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Train and Road. I'm Coach Jonathan Lee, and I don't have our head coach, Chad Timmerman, or our CEO, Nate Pearson. Instead, I have just one special guest with us here in studio, and that's uh, three-time Olympian, 15-time Canadian national champion, uh, multi-time BC bike race champion, and plenty other race winners, uh, Jeff Kabush. How you doing, man? Great. Good. Great Good to, to be here. here. Yeah. Thanks, man. Thanks for coming. So you actually spend a good amount of time close to us here in Trainer Road HQ, uh, living up in Truckee, right, every year? Yeah. Spend a large portion of the summers hanging out in the Truckee Tahoe area and a little bit a little bit in the winter when there's actually snow here. But <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, kind of bounce around between Canada and California, depending on the season and the racing going that's going on. But yeah, it's a great kind of summer base. We have a lot of races at altitude in the, the U.S., so it's a uh, nice place to hang out all around. Yeah, it's like that perfect elevation where it's not too high, but not too low. You're kind of like right in that sweet spot around six to 7,000 feet, right? Yeah, yeah, still getting some good training and uh, not not feel too bad. Yeah, not, yeah. Not too pathetic, like up at 10,000. Well, I appreciate you joining us. Um, we had our, our CEO, he just had some sinus surgery. Our head coach is sick. We had plenty of things fell through, but you and I were actually – Yesterday, we were pre-riding uh, the California Enduro Series race. It's up at uh, North Star at the resort up there, uh, which is also an EWS Continental race. Yeah. Um, so we were, we were being XC dudes, but uh, pretending to be Enduro bros yesterday. Um, and thank you for, for taking the time to come in and do this. I appreciate it. Uh, we've asked a bunch of questions in our Ask a Cycling Coach podcast Facebook group, and you can join that. Just check it out on Facebook. Uh, it's where a ton of other podcast listeners just like you are at, and they're asking questions and, and sharing what's working for them. Uh, if you have other questions, you'll be surprised to see how many people probably have a similar situation and can help you out in there. Uh, or if you just want to get more participatory with the podcast, you can join us there. And uh, we're also streaming live right now on Facebook and YouTube, so you can join us that way. Uh, one quick announcement before we get into the questions that you've already sent in to us for Jeff uh, is on Tuesday, September 18th, so that's during Interbike. We're going to be having a live podcast recording party here at Trainer Road. A guest is still to be announced. Uh, we're working on a few different options, but we'll let you know when that goes uh, goes live there. But that's Tuesday, September 18th. So if you're going to be in the region uh, at all, uh, you should come over. We're going to have uh, good drinks and good apps, and it's going to be a good time. So join us for that on Tuesday, September 18th. The next night is actually Reno Cross, which you'll be racing. I will. So, yeah. yeah. Um, I guess with that, Let's just get into some of the questions that people have submitted. 
Uh, first one, <laughs> this is kind of funny. Uh, the first one's from Chris along the lines of gravel racing. And he says, how does Jeff feel about aero bars and gravel races? Maybe we can explain a little bit behind, like <laughs> behind the scenes. Cause You're you an raced idiot. No. <laughs> <laughs> so you raced dirty Kanza this year. I did. Uh, yeah. it's uh, an extremely long gravel race for those that don't know. And the Flint Hills of Kansas, a lot of rolling Hills, uh, windy conditions, uh, weather conditions have tr- traditionally contributed to it. Sharp little flint rock everywhere that yeah. slices up. Uh, but quite a stink got made uh, beforehand because you took a harsh stance on aero bars because it's kind of gravel, so I guess there's kind of no rules. But people started using aero bars in a mass yeah. group race. Well, I think I right? used a bit of humor, which hopefully <laughs> most people got and wrote a little editorial with a bit of a fiery headline <laughs> saying you're an idiot if you're running aero bars at Dirty Kanza. But <laughs> no, my feeling, which I think a lot of people are feeling, is it's a, definitely a safety concern. I mean, there's no other mass start event, uh, I mean, where you're allowed to start with aero bars in a mass group. And especially on a surface like gravel, it's uh, I feel it's definitely a safety concern. And uh, mm-hmm. um became more and more popular after the previous year's winner used aero bars and uh it definitely made me nervous and unfortunately i mean there's there's been a few incidents now crashing the the chase group which took a cu- couple guys out and uh you know and i don't think it's a lot of a conversation that a lot of people were were willing to start but i was i was happy to bring up it <laughs> bring it up and you know um most people were able to have a, a good laugh. I don't know if uh, those guys at a Dirty Cans will, will change their minds, but uh, no, I wanted to, you know, get the conversation started for sure. It is dangerous. I mean, you don't have breaks. Um, like even in a, like in team time trials that I've done, and I'm sure plenty of triathletes or, or road racers are listening to this and they've been in the aero bars, you know how like you're basically a guided missile. You don't have brakes at reach. You have to get out of your position yeah. and grab those. And then when you're on a mixed surface like like gravel, it gets a whole lot more complex. Yeah, and know? I mean, there's no no question. There's a performance advantage, and so right. uh, yeah. as long as they're legal, I mean, like Ted, who won, I don't. He would prefer not to have to use them, but he used them uh, with good effect to to win the race. Uh, um, uh, but it's tough. I mean, the, the community really wants to be inclusive and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, certainly when you're out there in the wind by yourself, uh, it's, it's nice for some of the people to, to save a bit of energy, but, uh, overall I would definitely hope to see, um, like many other races move towards where Ben and the aero bars. I, I just really felt it kind of was effective. The race to the front kind of negatively kind of yeah. tactics and just wasn't as, fun a race when guys could just sit on the front in the aero bars. Yeah. We'll get into another aero bars discussion <laughs> later on. Um, <laughs> but, uh, with gravel itself, the other question that came in from Igor, he said, is the gravel category really necessary and does it have any real purpose in cycling or is it just marketing? I've done a few gravel events now. Um, I would say that I guess I have a stance on this, but what's your stance? Do you feel like it's just purely a marketing employee by the cycling industry? It's very like, you know, that's kind of the tin hat explanation for gravel. Or do you think it has its own stand on? I mean, I think it's, it's that style of riding is definitely surging in popularity for good reason. Um, as far as the, you know, differences in the bikes, it's, uh, there's definitely subtle differences between cyclocross, uh, bikes and gravel bikes, but there's definitely, it's definitely a separate category, especially I ride open bikes, which, are really um, much more capable in what they can do in the tires. And I think that's where the biggest difference is the tire development we've seen yeah. on, on gravel, the the bigger size from where all cross has been centered around, you know, 32, 33 C mm-hmm. tires because that's the, the rules for racing, but we're seeing 40, 42s, 45s. And even on my gravel bike, I can run 27.5 mountain bike tires, which is the biggest the nicest thing about that style of riding, I think, is uh, people are realizing it's getting away from the traffic and the back roads. And, I mean, yeah. it really opens up the, the possibilities of, of rides, especially up here, Truckee, Tahoe, a lot of roads. And even I train down the East Bay, which there's a lot of traffic, and uh, just the different rides it can do in the East Bay parks on my, my gravel bike still get in a nice, you know, endurance training ride, but uh, hardly see a, a solo out there on kind of the 
the park park road so i've really enjoyed that kind of change uh getting getting away from the traffic and yeah still getting that experience it's been su- i i feel like it's a safety thing and like we didn't create trainer road to make it safer for people to train we created it to make people faster but that's definitely a side component and we think about like the you know the insane amount of hours that people have been training inside rather than outside and i'm sure that it's you know saved folks from certain incidents you know for with traffic and yeah it's really nice to have with gravel racing not only the safety aspect you know it gets you away from the cars but like you said it opens up so many more options for training like for me since I have gotten a cross bike, which I use as a gravel bike, right? Yeah. Um, I'm able to, and I got a cross bike and I got a Sawyer straw, which is like a filtration straw. Oh yeah. And those two things then opened up my routes dramatically, right? Because before, you know, I could go on roads, but then I was stuck to whatever roads were established in there or safe or, you know, insert whatever other contingency you need. But then if I wanted to go on gravel, I could just run out of water. So that was a big concern because you don't come across service stations. Yeah. But as long as I'm carrying good spares and good tools, and then I bring a Sawyer straw along, and then I just look at the route and I go, okay, there's a draw there. There's a stream there. I can fill up. It's been awesome. Like my training rides have completely changed. They don't have to be the long road routes anymore. It can be yeah. different. I mean, and it's I, pretty nice. in the winter, I mean, disc brakes have made a huge difference on I mean, road bikes, curly bar bikes in general, but yeah. I mean, most of the winter I just train on kind of 40 C Maxxis refuse tires, which are really heavy train mm-hmm. tire, which still do normal road rides. But if I feel like it jump on, you know, kind of the rails to trails rides and dart in and out of a few bike paths, which, you know, it's all about avoiding those traffic lights, which yeah. <laughs> makes the, the ride go smooth, more enjoyable. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good, those refuses are what, um, a number of us have them here at trainer road too. It's a solid tire. It's like, yeah, super versatile. Um, let's get into some questions about planning and execution, uh, that people have on this one. So this one's from Sean. Uh, he says, it seems like Jeff's season goes all year round without any breaks. How does he maintain peak fitness with such a heavy race schedule? And I mean, we should cover, you race some cyclocross. You yeah. even race a road race every once in a while. I remember last year you raced a crit. Yeah. Um, but it's predominantly mountain bike racing and then some gravel mixed in. So it, it is all year, right? Yeah. I mean, pretty much. Uh, this year I got a bit later start in April, but I'll race through till November this year. Um, but I think I think the big thing for people to understand is the years I have training kind of in the bank. I mean, going on. I don't know, 25 years of racing and competing, but I think most of all now I just enjoy being healthy and taking care of myself and Mm -hmm. uh, finding that balance. I think a lot of it comes down to mental, Mm. um, keeping up a full schedule, and that's what luckily I do so many different things that it doesn't get stale mentally. Um, Mm. Also train around or traveling around so the – the training and roads, uh, don't get too boring. And, uh, Mm -hmm. these days I'm racing so much. I don't have to do a ton of, you know, specific training. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think the big thing for me is keeping new events, fresh events. And, um, I, I don't know how, uh, like some of the ladies like Sabine Spitz and Gunnarita Doll have just been doing World Cup XCs for years and years and years. And, uh, it's still doing well. No, it's impressive to <laughs> how they can keep up the mo- motivation doing a singular kind of event. But yeah, no, even back in the day, I'd, I'd race through the fall, but always find uh, some kind of new event. I mean, I did Xterra Worlds a couple of years, ran a couple of marathons in the fall, or uh, do some trail running races. But um, most of all, I think, yeah, I just enjoy being healthy and fit and enjoy that feeling. Yeah. Um, uh, it's it's painful when you let things slide so <laughs> but i mean in the winter uh, it's, it's definitely fitting in those mental breaks all uh in canada i'll do and down here when there's snow like some nordic skiing and backcountry touring and just mm-hmm. try to fit in those breaks and kind of mix things up but always kind of keeping the body going and then kind of fine-tuning it depending on the, the events i'm doing so you kind of like uh you basically like maintain like a a, a pretty high amount of fitness it may not be like career peak fitness, and then you just specialize based on the events that are coming up, right? Like you just start to tailor your training a little bit more based on whether it's that long gravel race or a short XC race. Yeah, and I think uh, 
the big thing, especially at, at my age, is not putting myself in too big a hole or, mm. or, or getting sick. It's knowing it's a, a quote, one of my old uh, mentors and coaches, you have to have the courage to take it easy. So it's yeah. it's always yeah. better to take uh, an extra rest day than uh, extra hard training day to kind of, for me especially, it's it's much better to stay fresh and motivated than dig myself in a little bit too deep a hole. But overall, like keeping it going year round, I think I I kind of fit in mini breaks throughout the year. Hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't take a huge chunk off ever. I just kind of, I'll take a week or 10 days here and there between what I'm doing, but I always just, yeah, enjoy exercising and uh, being healthy. Do you mind sharing your age as a point of reference for those that are listening? Um, 41, no. 41. Yeah. Yeah. So, the, and you mentioned the fact that like, you know, since it's changed, right? In the sense that like at this point you, if you do put yourself in a hole, have you noticed that it's harder to dig out of that? Or what differences have you noticed from, you know, aging from being a young 20 something racing or mid 20 something racing to now being 40? Do you have to plan less days of intensity or more days of recovery between what changes have you made? I think it's, yeah, just, I mean, at this point in my career as an athlete, I'm very aware of my body, but, uh, it's definitely, I mean, I'm still highly motivated, but the body can't keep up with that motivation (laughs) sometimes. And I think my last couple of years, um, of racing the world cup XC's kind of making a push for the 2016 Olympics, I was pushing too hard and, um, Mm -hmm. not allowing my, my body enough time to recover and kind of learn from that to, um, really pay attention to my body and, and, you know, and work out workouts, really listening to my body to kind of adjust yeah. based on the, the feeling and, uh, how things are, are going, but for sure, making sure to be these days a little more conservative on, on the rest and recovery. Yeah. And I'm sure you, I mean, you pull from a bank of years and years and years of, of fitness that probably allows you to a certain amount of like, not only do you know your body better and everything else, but, you know, carrying that aerobic fitness year after year after year also, I'm sure has some sort of residual effect in helping out. You know, uh, we see that with a lot of athletes that have been training for years like that. So, yeah, yeah. have that kind of structural fitness and some people call it old man fitness, I hear <laughs> <laughs> or old man strength, but, uh, I think it's experience and it's truly just, you know, a huge amount of aerobic conditioning that, you know, your body, you really are changing your body with training. So yeah. you change it for years like that. It does have like substantial changes to it. No, a lot of awareness. And, you know, I did a, a lot of physiology work and testing. And, um, I think the most powerful part of all that is kind of associating all that that physiology testing and data with the body feeling and now Mm -hmm. i can because i had so much data and physiology work that i can kind of relate that just to my feeling out on the bike so even without any gadgets i'm really aware of where where i'm at and what my body's doing yeah we talk about that a ton like uh power meter uh, power power data is fantastic to have it's incredible for training especially um but it shouldn't, you know, it doesn't replace perception uh, across the board. It should inform your perception, right? Like you should have that dialed in, in terms of what your body can do and the effort and everything else. Yeah. No, my, uh, one of my early mentors and coaches was one of the early adopters of, of lactate testing, which has kind of gone out of style now, but we, uh, poked our fingers so many times that, uh, (laughs) could pretty much go off the feeling and we'd have a game of kind of guessing where our our lactate was was, and we could always be within 0.1 or 2. Do you remember where your threshold was in terms of uh, lactate? Because standards usually four millimoles per liter is what they usually say. Well, we'd use a kind of different testing. And back in those days, we were just testing on rollers with kilometers before power meters came out. Interesting. Yeah. uh, yeah. On heart rate. But we do a test a uh, little different kind of it was the lactate balance point. So we'd yeah. go up to a max and then drop down and kind of associate uh, a heart rate with kind of a stable lactate balance point and base our training off that kind of lactate balance point. Yeah. Did you ever get your lactate actually tested, like the blood lactate levels? Uh, we had a little portable lactate meter that I'd carry yeah. in, in training. Yeah. Um, so we'd have do the lab testing and then 
carry it and training a lot to kind of monitor out on the road. We, we got that done, I think a year, two years ago, probably a listener can help us here. That's listening live and let us know. But, uh, I, we did that and mine was like, my, my lactate levels are off the charts. That sadly means nothing in terms of true performance, but like it was nuts. I think I was at 12 for my, for my lactate threshold, 12 millimoles per liter. And then I peaked at 22. Wow. Well, VO2 max. Fast twitch there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what we figure, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah fast yeah. twitch. Yeah, not a whole lot of slow twitch in there. Um, but it's always interesting. I guess that they find that in like slalom skiers. They see in the most successful slalom skiers a high correlation to, you know, that. And also that's a lot of fast twitch. So, yeah. Yeah, it'd be kind of interesting to see. Cause you, do you, nowadays you're doing longer events, but I mean, so you did XCO sort of stuff for a long time, which is relatively shorter. Um, you're also really good in short track events. Like at the Epic rides races, you're always, uh, you're always a favorite at every one of the fat tire crits they do. Do you prefer long or short? And do you find that your physiology lends it with, lends itself to one or the other? Yeah. I mean, my history and strengths were always in the, the pacing and endurance. <clears throat> and that's actually what cross country was when I started. Yes. Yeah, uh, my, I always tell the story, my junior worlds I went to for mountain bike, my, uh, the XC junior race was one in over two and a half hours and I was, wow. I was around three hours. And so, I mean, when I started, it was more two hours, 15, two and a half. And yeah, I mean, my strength was like the last 30, 45 minutes. And yeah. as my career evolved, they basically took out the best part of my race. And so that was, that was a challenge, uh, towards the end of my kind of, uh, XCO career was adapting to that, you know, punchier, harder, shorter racing. Um, mm-hmm. which was a challenge for me with my, um, more, I think basic endurance physiology to adapt. And as well, the XC races got steeper up and down. So they're much more explosive, which, uh, was a challenge for me to adapt, but you know, I really enjoy, I mean, the fat tire crits is I think more experience yeah. um, and tactics, which I really enjoy. I got a chance to race on the road for several years for some pro Conti teams and, uh, didn't make the decision to switch over for several reasons, but yeah. really wish I got a chance to do a little more racing. Cause I, you know, really enjoy events where you can use your head. And yeah. Experience. That's uh, the tactics aspect of it is super fun. And I noticed that like in the fat tire crits, I've ridden a couple of the Epic rides, fat tire crits with the pros. And, uh, if you're not, you know, if you're in toward the back, it's absolutely terrible. It's just brutal um, because the accelerations are so hard out, out of every turn. You're yo-yoing and, yeah. you know, not much width, but um, it's a full tactician's race for sure. Yeah. No, I'm really jealous now that uh, <laughs> the short tracks are getting to the World Cup level. Yeah. Because I really enjoyed racing them domestically at the U.S. Nationals for years. And, uh, yeah, yeah, it's fun. It's interesting watching just the the tactics and maybe I can become a short track coach for some of those races. Cause it's definitely yeah. interesting to watch at that level. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty fun. Um, let's get into uh, a couple other questions more on the, the tactical, or I should say technique side of things. So, um, this one comes from James. He says, how does Jeff approach the multi-year planning or forgive me from Matthew? He says, does Jeff program in time or program in time for sessioning or skill development, considering he is competing now in high level enduro races, which is this weekend. It's not EWS, you know, the, the global tour, but it's continental and it's, it's a stacked field. It's a real lot of good guys. Or does he try to incorporate single track into his day-to-day training to keep his skills sharp when required? Uh, and if I could just add on to this too, uh, there are, there are XC riders that really don't have what I would consider like, um, technical skills that would enable them to be competitive in something like enduro racing. That's a little bit more tougher, Yeah. but you're definitely not one of those riders. Um, you're the rider that has the skills to, that can transfer over to that. Um, when you're looking for an XC side of things, absolutely. You know, um, is that something that you've always developed I and mean, did you just develop it by having fun as a kid on a bike or did you have to consciously make those efforts to become a better technical rider? Well, I think it's both. Um, I mean, I was really lucky growing up in Canada and BC on, on Vancouver Island as a place to start out my mountain biking and learning. And I think that's the challenge for people that don't live in technical terrain or areas, uh, you know, like Colorado where you can't really ride in the wet. It's a challenge because it's, I really feel like it's that kind of daily training environment where it's, it's hard to pack that skill development into like a weekend camp. It's really yeah. subtle skills that you kind of, to become, you know, efficient, um, technically it's those subtle skills that takes a lot of time. And I was lucky, 
you know, growing up in BC that I was racing and riding those trails every mm-hmm. day growing up. Uh, but it's also, I mean, for the enduro races, I mean, even later in my career, I start off uh, doing a few events like Trans uh mm-hmm. six day um, blind enduro, and I'll do Trans Cascade River Fall. And I f- felt like that even, I mean, pushing your comfort limits always, uh, when I came back to XC, it really, really helped. But for me now, racing enduro, it's, it's more putting in time on it. It's definitely an adjustment going from a XC bike to an enduro bike. Yeah. And, uh, if I'm going to race, I definitely want to put in the time to make sure I'm, I'm comfortable pushing on that bike with the suspension set up and mm-hmm. tires and knowing the limits. And, uh, that's what takes, I think, uh, a little bit of focused training on a different bike. So you're, even when you first jump on an enduro bike from an XC bike, it doesn't feel like you can go as fast because you're just not used to how the bike's reacting. Yeah. But um, definitely it's it's valuable to, you know, get on a bike. And if there's something to challenge you, I think even like riders racing an XC course, if there's something you want to, you know, session it uh, over and over and learn from it, you don't want to just ride it one lap and then see it 20 minutes later. And yeah. it's uh, really that focus progression of riding it and getting that feeling over and over again. Yeah, we were doing that yesterday uh, when we were pre-riding. We were stopping, examining lines, theorizing, <laughs> testing yeah. those theories, and then turning around and going back and doing it again. Uh, it's something that, like, uh, it's it's definitely common in the in the context of reconning. But I also noticed that you spend like a good amount of time also riding in spots that have like you know jump trails or even stuff like that. Like I see that more regularly than I would see a lot of cross country racers doing. Um, is that something that's picked up because kind of like your motto, uh, in the past couple of years is keep riding until the fun stops. Right. Uh, is that something that just, if you find it more fun and thusly you've been doing that later on in your career, or have you always been the type of person to vary it up like that? I mean, I think it's always something and why I'm still enjoying the sport is it's fun to keep progressing and learning. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I didn't, I didn't grow up jumping, so it's definitely a challenge. So it's fun to slowly push my limits and mm-hmm. get more comfortable and learn new skills. And, uh, that's what I enjoy. I mean, I really enjoy the blind intro cause it's not so committing, but, yeah. uh, like this, uh, this weekend it's definitely pushing my, my comfort level a little <laughs> bit, but yeah. It, yeah. it's fun to, I mean, even at this age in the sport, still be learning. That's something over my career. I was always learning whether it was skills or learning about my body or nutrition or, racing different disciplines. And, uh, I think, uh, it's, it's really positive as an athlete to develop, to even try different disciplines. I mean, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like we mentioned, I did dirty Kenza this year, which was something new and, uh, definitely something I was thinking about in learning as far as, uh, nutrition and equipment and setup and really enjoy that process of always kind of learning something new. So we have a blog post. It's on blog.trainerroad.com all about that performance that you did at Dirty Kanza. Um, one thing that I was super impressed with, if you don't mind jumping into a bit of the learnings that you had on the nutrition side of that, yeah. was you were able to take in a huge amount of, of fast processing, what people would consider like traditional ride food, like, you know, a ton of, of, uh, you know, the, the goo chomps or goo gels, uh, you were taking in a bunch of that stuff with their rocktane drink mix, um, rather than taking in, you know, rice cakes and solid foods or anything else like that, or like whole foods. Yeah. I found that a consistency that I found in top level athletes is that they're, that's another, they're like professional eaters and their body is a professional digester. Yeah. Uh, is that something that you had to work into as well? Or have you always just had an iron gut being able to just do such a long event on just that sort of fuel? Well, it's, um, I mean, it's product that I regularly use in training and, but it's still definitely had to eat a lot more than I was u- used to. So, yeah. but I definitely looked, I mean, looked into what my gut can, um, the science behind with goo, how much you can absorb yeah. in your stomach and then work that into some of my training rides. Um, but I, I mean, early in the race when the pace wasn't intense, I had a few solid bars, but it was just harder to eat when the race is on. And, uh, those, those products are designed to get in the body quick and easy. Uh, when you're breathing hard, it's easy way in and still learn to 
a few things for next year for sure, just as equipment set up. But um, what would you have changed, whether it's equipment or nutrition? On both, uh, both fronts. My hands definitely felt bruised at the end. Yeah, I was uh, <laughs> had some two mil bar tape. Uh, I was just too lazy. Oof. I didn't want to retape like yeah. the night before in case it settles. But I definitely run at least some uh, thicker bar tape or even some padding. Just like eleven hours of of pounding on the bars and. Uh, I got a little bit behind on the nutrition, kind of three quarters of the way into the race. I definitely kind of up uh, up the nutrition a little bit, so I didn't hit that low spot. But yeah. luckily, I was able to catch myself at the third feed zone, kind of catch up a little bit on the sugar and finish strong. But uh, yeah, yeah, we'll see. I haven't committed to next year, <laughs> yeah. but. Uh, <laughs> Fun atmosphere out there. The race uh, is pretty brutal, but definitely a fun fun event to be at. Yeah, yeah. I don't. Th- people keep asking us to do the dirty cans, and I don't think I don't know if I ever want to. Um, uh, so something. Let's talk really quick on the pre riding side of things. So a few things I noticed yesterday is that um, when we were looking at lines, and this is something that I've I was thinking about. This like, oh, I want to share this with our podcast listeners. Like, uh, this is definitely something that could help. Uh, we, when we were looking at setting up for different obstacles and everything else, I, I, at least I feel like this is something that I do. And I noticed the same thing in you is that we don't look at the trail within the context of what the trail wants you to see as much as we just look at the terrain and we look at how to best utilize the terrain. And kind of what I'm getting at there is the fact that like the trail will have marks, skid marks, lines that will be very straight going in a specific location but it seems like your eye instantly looks at how to use the surrounding terrain, not just go in the path, but, and not just going, we're not talking going off course, but how to use the pitch, how to use the rocks in that region to change that. What sort of things, when you're going into like a technical rock garden, for example, are there certain things that you look for first or how do you assess one? Like, how do you break one down? Clearly it's different for each, but are there any principles you use? I mean, it's, it's obviously the actual, feature itself is um looking for lines that are going to be smooth and you're going to be confident but i think like a few of the sections um yesterday points that are important that a lot of people don't think about are entry and exit speed too Mm -hmm. um where um a lot of times like a rock garden you're going to ride different lines at a similar speed but it's more the hesitation coming in and out of it is where there's Mm -hmm. a lot more more time gained and Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, yeah, looking at the bigger picture and as well as what you're going to be confident riding every time. And as well, uh, up there with the rocks, it's kind of managing your equipment too. Um, <laughs> yeah. If I, uh, I mean, I wasn't, probably won't run, you know, like really thick downhill casing tires and um, using some some carbon wheels, which don't don't want to just pick up and jump into some of those rock gardens. So it's... right. And races like Downeyville, which we do as well, it's kind of, you know, managing your skills and equipment and what's going to be the fastest to the finish line and not necessarily what's the raddest line to (laughs) descend sometimes. Yeah. Like another point that I saw yesterday is on a lot of turns, big banked berm turns, you were actually cutting inside on them when we were pre-riding. Was that because you prefer insides traditionally or were you just testing that out when we were going through that stuff testing it out too and um looking at what's going to be i guess the most efficient too as far as from a energy standpoint a lot of times a lot of lines will be similar speeds but what lines are going to take the most most energy and um again like yeah some of those those sections up there um a lot of people will be at high speed and just smashing the pedals but it's uh yeah. A lot of those sessions, I'll get up to speed and just be tucking because may lose half a second, but you'll have a save a little horsepower for where you can really lay it down and make more effective use of that. And that's in the, those corners too. Just uh, yeah, saving energy and being efficient to like lay it down when you know it will make a difference. Uh, Jerome's question, this kind of ties into what we're talking about. He says a couple years ago, Jeff had mentioned he could have given some technical lessons to many of his world cup fellow racers <laughs> that year. The race course was in La Bresse, That's in France. And it's actually coming up this weekend, uh, this year's edition, I should say. And it was muddy and slick. So he says, how about giving some advice on riding and racing in slick and muddy conditions? Um, so in those sort of conditions, 
what did you wish the writers would have been doing or what did you wish they would have known? Well, yeah, I remember that one because that was leading into um, 2016 qualifications and I was really frustrated there because I was back in the pack and I mean, I definitely rode the descents way faster just pre-riding and I pretty much didn't pedal and break down those whole trails and I mean, you'll see that um, a couple weeks ago was the Mont Sinan World Cup and mm -hmm. a lot of the riders um, take their setup like full XE from very fitness-based course and when they get to a technical course they don't really adjust that you know low and um low low bars and stiff yeah. suspension and yeah. um i think uh yeah if people adjusted their their bike setup slightly they'd have a lot more success and be a lot more comfortable in some of those really steep challenging sections so is that just throwing are you talking like <clears> minimal <throat> changes like you know putting a spacer underneath that stem or, you know, maybe a stem that isn't quite as negative of a rise? Yeah, just adjusting from, I mean, a lot of um, XEO riders can be very particular and they want to, you know, have the, take the setup from their road bike or, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like, uh, I mean, in, throughout my career, I was always, you know, a bit more progressive in my equipment selections, uh, early adopting the, you know, disc brakes or through axles or mm -hmm. riser bars or single rings, things that worked in the mud and made it more, more comfortable. But I mean, yeah, um, some racers tend to be really rigid because they just have one set up and that's what they know. And, um, I think it's a benefit of riding dis different disciplines and, uh, being aware of how much more comfortable and confident you can be on slightly different setups. We're, we're going to get into your equipment setup soon on the different bikes you ride. Um, so we'll talk about stem length and I'll, I'll get into all that. I'm making a mental note right now. Um, but one thing I wanted to talk about is technique tips for really slick and muddy conditions. We hardly ever have them here yeah. where we're from, because if it rains, you simply don't ride because your wheels just get covered yeah. in peanut butter mud and you'll be done. Uh, so I've been in certain or a couple of situations where it has been really muddy and slick. And I feel like I have a relative advantage coming from motocross. I'm used to not having traction, yeah. um, but I still was a total fish out of water. Are there any principles or tips that you utilize regularly or think of when you're riding in muddy and slick conditions? Cause you grew up in that. Sort yeah. Of yeah. I mean, a lot of it's experience, but there's definitely some bike setups for sure. Lowering the, the pressure and rubber compound mix. I mean, mm. a huge difference, especially riding in Canada in the winter um, on really greasy stuff. A softer rubber compound can go a long way to kind of increasing your confidence. So that's like uh, if Maxis has like their max grip compound, that yeah. that be, yeah, something along that, those lines? Yeah, I mean, I remember uh, one of the first Nobra, which was the U.S. national races I won down in Waco, Texas was nice. on that kind of clay, like super greasy, um, terrain and, uh, people just couldn't stick in the corners. And I actually got Maxis to make up some special, um, super tacky, which was a really low durometer, sticky XE tires. And I'm pretty sure I won that race because I just was so relaxed and had so much traction in the corners that, uh, yeah. saved so much energy. But yeah, it's amazing how much difference, uh, a softer rubber compound with, uh, you know, a little more volume so you can lower the pressure and, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, just, uh, it's having that confidence. Cause yeah, once you lose confidence in those, those conditions and tense up, it's, uh, yeah, being able to relax and kind of just subtle stuff. I think knowing, which takes a lot of time to develop, but yeah, knowing where your rear wheel is uh, yeah. and just, uh, modulating your power. I mean, in dry conditions, you can just, you know, open the throttle, but in the wet conditions, it's a lot of you know, subtle on off power. You got to like ease off the power when you know you're going over roots and looking for the traction kind of in between the roots when you're um, going uphill or downhill. Yeah. Something that I noticed too, is like a, a certain comfort that like a rider at your level has with a loss of traction too. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's like, where you see on cr in cyclocross too, like being uh -huh. comfortable, not being in control. And that's where I think a lot of people struggle is because they always want to be in control on a descent and, um, you got to be a little bit comfortable getting loose. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's kind of a change and that helps in mud because you so rarely have relatively speaking, you so rarely have control, right? Like, yeah. or traction for sure. Um, it's something that I've noticed at least that, I mean, this helps across the board dry or wet is a lot of people think they need to get back. And this is something that we talked about when we did a deep dive on how to become a faster mountain biker with Lee McCormick uh, from yeah. Lee likes bikes. Um, you know, he was always saying not back low, like low is where you want to go, not back. And I find a lot of riders, especially when they get tense or they're afraid of what could happen in front of them, they raise their chest up quite a lot. Yeah. Um, the best descenders I see in technical moments, their, their chest is very low, um, down toward that stem, right? It's, it's pretty darn low. Yeah. Um, and that I assume has to help keep more traction on that front wheel in the mud. Um, is that something that you, you like, I guess you've got it trained in, but do you have to think of that sort of thing in those conditions? No, I mean, for me, it's, it's a lot of feel just from my experience, but I definitely see that. I don't know if you'd call it an error, but yeah. yeah. Um, coming to a technical section, dry or wet that people are getting really far back and that's, yeah, mm -hmm. when you, um, lose the, the traction on the front wheel and a lot of that, I think, I see it more in XC racers. They want their fork to be really soft, but <laughs> a little harder fork allows you to, yeah, maintain a little bit more weight on your front wheel and traction on the front tire and the subtle stuff. But it uh, takes just, yeah, a lot of, you know, work to slowly learn those kind of subtle techniques and get comfortable, especially yeah. in the wet. That's what I was saying. It's hard to go to the Northwest for a weekend and get comfortable en route. It's kind of like that kind of daily train environment to kind of slowly learn that, that comfort level. I so badly want to get into gear. I'm a, I'm a gearhead. Um, but I'm going to hold off. We've got one more. <laughs> We've got a few more questions before we get to that. Uh, this one's from Steve. He says, how does Jeff keep his head in the race when things aren't going perfectly? And what types of things do you, uh, does he use to stay motivated through setbacks and or challenges? Um, you had a race that was challenging at Carson city off road for you, where you said you felt like this year, you felt like just the engines didn't fully turn on. Yeah. Um, how do you stay focused in that situation instead of just focusing on where you should be and kind of beating yourself up mentally? How do you, how do you handle that? Um, I mean, I think, uh, lucky that I always have a, another race the next weekend, but I think, uh, a lot of it is that, that I, take the value and enjoyment out of kind of the process of, of training. Um, and that's what I think you see a lot of people struggle with. Uh, they take all their value of the end result and, uh, it can, yeah, lead to kind of hollow existence if your, yeah. your value is all based on the, the final resort. But I've, I mean, I really enjoy just training. Um, sometimes I wish I just had more time to train in between, uh, really enjoy the process of, of riding my bike. And for sure it's, it's can be really frustrating with, uh, when things are going wrong, especially I found more so when I'm, you know, I was racing over in Europe and it was a struggle and challenge mm -hmm. and, uh, but always find, yeah, some time back home and, uh, having that experience to know it's, you know, it's even after however, 20, 25 years, the, the body's, a uh, a complicated thing and if I uh, knew how to make it click every time I'd probably mm -hmm. be a rich man but <laughs> yeah, um, right. you just gotta I mean stay with the process um, I think the mistake most people make is when they are have some setback or challenges they feel like they gotta train harder and that can be the, the mm -hmm. worst thing to do sometimes it's uh, if you've if you know you've put in the hard work it's uh, I find most of the time it's uh, a matter of fatigue levels and uh giving yourself uh, a little bit of rest. And um, when I get to a period like that or I get overtired, I, I usually just um, – motivation is a, a good indicator for me. When I'm motivated to get back on the bike, I'll just uh, take some time off, especially I need to, you know, kind of employ that tactic when I, when I do stuff like BC Bike Race, which is, you know, yeah. seven days of – and this year was really hard racing. And, and afterwards, I just have to really kind of – go by feel, really take it easy until, uh, you know, I might do just some easy spins, but, you know, wait until I get that motivated feel, fresh feel to get back and get him into training. And, um, yeah. if anything, yeah, when people go through, you know, 
tough period that's uh, pushing a bit too hard. At your first Olympics, you've been to three Olympics, right? Yeah. Uh, your first Olympics, did you get eighth <coughs> place? Is that right? Uh, ninth in Sydney, yeah. Ninth in Sydney. That was kind of my yeah, breakout result. And then you had a 20th, I believe, at the next Olympics. Is that right? Yeah, that was really – I mean, that was a frustrating one. So Olympic. how'd you deal with that? Like, cause that's like, like you said, a race every weekend, but like, you know, I'm sure at every Olympics you were probably thinking, you never know, this could be the, the last Olympics or only Olympics, right? Yeah. So how'd you deal with that sort of a disappointment? Because a lot of people, you know, most people listening to this, uh, are not going to the Olympics. Uh, you know, we, we won't go, but we have these like big A races and, and we yeah. build them up and it might as well be the Olympics for our minds. Right. Cause we build them up so much. How'd you deal with that uh, when you got 20th, uh, when you felt like you should have been higher up in that order? No, I mean, that was frustrating on a lot of le levels. I mean, yeah, Olympics, it's uh, only every four years, and mm -hmm. who knows if you get another chance. Um, so that was tough. I mean, I had a couple mechanicals there, and uh, that was during, like, kind of some of the best years on the bike. Um, so, I mean, I just um, took value out of, you know, knew that my fitness was there and luckily had a world cup the the weekend after that where i finished third on the podium which i mean almost made the olympics yeah uh result even more frustrating but uh, <laughs> i mean uh after olympics uh went to the the closing ceremonies and had a drink and uh shotgun contest with Yao Ming, but that was, <laughs> nice. that was, that was my <laughs> Olympic highlight. And, uh, yeah, you just have to, I mean, whether it be success or disappointment, um, have a plan for after, you know, big races. Uh, I mean, a lot of people plan for success, but they don't plan for how to deal with it after. And same thing with disappointment and, you know, make a plan to, to move on and, uh, that's where you see, I think, a lot of log athletes struggle is almost more when they achieve these major goals or success and how yeah. they feel like life is going to be different, but uh, how to go into, you know, some depression after a major achievement because it's, uh, you know, where you're taking your value and planning for how to deal with success or disappointment. Yeah, and that doesn't have to just be like at the Olympic level. I think there is like a, a pretty real thing for a lot of people that write in and ask questions about like, you know, after a big race, even if they do well, like how to deal with those post-race blues. So to yeah, speak, they I get. mean, I, I deal with that. It's kind of call it like post-season melancholy when, yeah. uh, you know, through the season you have a focus and another race and then you get to kind of the off season and kind of like, Oh, what do I do now? And it's, uh, yeah. that's where it's good to have, you know, more than just the bike or training or have some different interests so you can kind of dive into those and, um, not, uh, I think that's where it's tough if that's the only thing you have going on for some athletes. So it's, uh, I mean, I always advocate, uh, younger athletes to, you know, do some schooling along the way or have some, you know, activities or yeah. interests off the bike. So it's not such a singular focus. Yeah. Uh, did you beat Yao in the shotgun contest? Yeah. Nice. Can, uh, <laughs> I think it's still on YouTube <laughs> <Nice>. somewhere. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, let's, uh, get into Mark's we question. Actually traded, got a, still have like on my accreditation, we had a shotgun contest and then traded pins. So I got a little Chinese oh, that's pretty pin, rad. pin on my Olympic accreditation from back then. Holy cow. Yeah. That's a, that's a cool story, man. That's awesome. Uh, Let's look at uh, this one from Chris. He says, what cadence do you use in races? Uh, do, and then do you train in, a, in any way for that specific cadence? Uh, Chris mentions that his is usually for cross country around 70 to 90 uh, road. He's usually 90 to 110. He's usually higher on the road. Uh, do you notice the difference between the two? And then are you even conscious of that or do you strive for that at this point? It's, uh, I mean, I'm not conscious of it, but for sure on the mountain bike, it's lower. Mm -hmm. um, lower cadence on the road. Um, maybe not that high, but definitely, you know, 85, 90 on the road and on the mountain bike, it'll more be like 75, 80, but yeah. it's more, especially in the wrong, lo longer races, um, trying to keep it light, kind of light torque and efficient, uh, with the gearing. So not, um, uh, using, um, too much power to kind of save that, those kind of the higher torque and power for the end of the races. Um, so it's kind of, I mean, yeah using the cadence, which uh, keeps the load light on the muscles for yeah. when you need it. 
Yeah. Uh, this is going to be the last technique question that we have, uh, and then we're going to get into the equipment stuff. I'm, I'm excited for that. Uh, he says, uh, this one's from Trey, and he basically is asking, he said that he feels like he understands line choice. He comes from motorsports racing, uh, car racing specifically, I believe. Um, and in this case, he's talking about, like, he feels like he understands line theory and race craft and how to, like, you know, follow the grip through a turn but he never feels like he's comfortable in with front end grip when he's racing cross country. He said he feels fine in other situations, but with cross country on a cross country bike, he doesn't. Um, what do you do to manage front end grip? I mean, my mind goes to equipment and I guess we can go to that thereafter, but on a, like technique wise, um, I was mentioning like keeping my chest low. That's one thing that I do, but is there something you do to manage front end grip in tricky conditions? Um, I think it's, I mean, I use a lot of different tires, and so it's knowing the the limits of those tires. I guess is mm -hmm. is good to get comfortable with. Um, I think a lot of it, if you're you're not feeling comfortable with your front tire, it comes down to I think pressure and tire compound, which, like I mentioned, can make a huge difference in the mm -hmm. the front end grip. Uh, but I mean, you definitely it's hard to race if you don't have um, confidence in your your front end grip. So I think it's definitely worth running a little more knob, but, um, uh, I think it's, uh, getting that neutral position on the bike. Um, uh, mm. um, that's a lot to do, I guess, with suspension setup too. I think see the mistake of some XC riders on, on XC <laughs> bike running really soft front forks. And so yeah. kind of when it gets more aggressive, kind of blowing through that travel and yeah. then put which puts their kind of body out of balance a bit but um yeah. same thing and being like we talked about being comfortable with the tires breaking loose and that just comes from i mean practice and um learning where that limit is i i think that learning where the limit is and we're just going to transition right into equipment here because learning where that limit is totally depends on the tire yeah, um, yeah. and i've found that certain tires give you a very clear indication of where that limit is, whereas others don't. That doesn't mean that you can't corner effectively on the one that doesn't give you the indication. You still can. Yeah. But uh, like a tire that I'm thinking of, and I'll just stick to the Maxxis line, uh, in this case, you're a Maxxis rider, but yeah. um, a tire like the Icon doesn't really seem to give me like an indication of when it's going to let go as much. It's more like a smooth gradient of when it'll let go versus something like uh, the Aspen, feels like it has a much more like solid lock in where you go, okay, if I go beyond this, uh, I'm in, you know, I'm in risky territory, but right here I'm kind of locked right in. And a lot of that has to do with, I've found is the gapping between the knobs as you roll that tire over and you know, how much surface area you have on the, on the ground between the knobs, everything else. Um, and that's something Trey possibly in your situation, I don't know what tires you're using, uh, but experiment with tires with perhaps slightly, you know, uh, maybe they've got side knobs that are a little taller. And maybe that can get you to the point where you're comfortable enough where you can figure out the technique and then kind of, you know, build off of that. Yeah. I mean, I'd add to that. A lot of it comes down to tire profile as well. I mean, the two tires you mentioned, the icons a much squarer profile mm -hmm. and the grip uh, confidence with that tire comes a lot down to the surface. I mean, mm -hmm. if it's a harder surface or like loose over, loose over hard or like roots, it's mm -hmm. not going to be as forgiving in the corners as the, the Aspen, which is a much rounder tire, which, uh, I mean, will carry a bit more speed in the corner, but also have a more predictable kind of mm -hmm. as you roll it into the transition. And so, I mean, yeah, the Aspen with loose over hard is much more predictable because it's kind of a softer transition as you roll it. And, uh, mm -hmm. so it's just experimenting. It's also depends on, you know, trace technique. Uh, some people lean the bike over a lot more and get into the cornering knobs on different tires. So it's, definitely worth experimenting with the different tire profiles and knob yeah. patterns to see which kind of suits your comfort level the, the most. On suspension setup too, with a fork, I find that a lot of XC riders run their fork too soft because they're hunting for front end feel because they might be compromising that with too much pressure in their tires or yeah. running a tire that just is inadequate for the type of riding or terrain that they're on. Um, so what they'll do is they'll feel like because their tire doesn't give them the traction they need, that they need to soften up the front end to get a little bit more control, which I, I see where they're going with that, but yeah. you're compromising so much with geometry. I'd recommend setting up the fork just as, you know, in terms of sag where 
you know, by the book where it should be yeah. dialing in any settings usually from there on an XC fork, you don't have much, you know, you'll have rebound damping and then you'll have compression, uh, just getting it all, you know, reasonable. And then from there trying to suss out the tire aspect of things. Cause I find a lot of XC guys they they run their forks either way too stiff or way too soft. It's so rare to see them sitting yeah. in that. You know, and yeah, in general, spot. the, um, a lot of the suspension companies work pretty hard in recommendations and I find they're, <laughs> they're pretty close to the mark. Uh, I'm usually, it's a, usually a really good starting position. They have charts with weights and I'm usually within a couple clicks off on the adjustment from there, but for sure. I mean, a lot of people set it up soft, so it feels good in the parking lot, but when you're in race <laughs> speed, kind of, uh, going hard, it's not going to give you the support or control. And I learned that a lot, uh, I mean, it's, I really encourage people to, you know, try different disciplines. And that's what I took from racing some of the enduro is, uh, definitely after racing some more challenging enduro events to definitely stiffened up my suspension. But I mean, you also have to have the strength and that's where I think a lot of people, um, mm. don't pay enough attention to the, the core and upper body strength that, uh, mountain biking takes. Um, oh, yeah. I always recommend it, uh, should be able to do 50 push-ups. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But that's, I mean, and that's one of the things, um, how effective a conditioned body can, um, upper body can help in, in endurance racing, uh, doing some testing back in the day with lactate, just after a big six or seven minute descent where hardly even pedaling or even did some testing in the gym, just using the upper body on kind of elliptical machine, how, um, jacked up the lactate can, de- can yeah. get when in the, those muscles that aren't endurance trained. So it's definitely worth, um, you know, training those muscles and that's where, you know, some time in the gym or what I prefer to do is just some Nordic skiing in the winter, kind of mm-hmm. developing that endurance strength and the upper body can make a big difference, even though it's not, not pushing the pedals, but, uh, helping to recycle, recycle and, uh, be more efficient on the trail. Oh yeah. Yeah. That strength is absolutely key. Uh, couldn't, yeah, couldn't agree more. On the equipment side of things, uh, Michael asks, how are you finding the new Stepcast 34? That's the Fox fork that you're running. It was new this year. Um, and we'll, I'll kind of describe what makes that fork unique. Adam also has a question on it. He says, how noticeable is the change shorter offset um, and the new Geo for forks like the Step Stepcast 34? So a lot of that probably sounds foreign to folks. But uh, basically, um, traditionally, uh, if you're looking at the diameter of the stanchions of a, of a suspension, uh, of a suspension fork, those are like the, you know, the shiny parts that basically go down into the rest of the fork. Right. And those have traditionally been 32 millimeters in diameter. And that's, uh, for cross country racing. That's what they've been. Uh, yeah. whereas 34 or even 36 for trail and enduro and, and downhill racing, uh, Fox even goes to a 40 for downhill stuff. Uh, and basically, you know, the, the bigger you get, the stiffer it is, uh, but you also have more weight as well with that. So that's why they've always stuck to the 32 to the smaller ones. But Fox now has a slightly broader diameter of 34, and then they make the chassis just a little bit more narrow and they kind of to shave some weight out of the whole thing. But the interesting thing is forks have a thing called an offset. And if you look at your road bike, if you're listening to this, your fork has a rake to it kind of like basically it's rare that it just follows perfectly at the head tube angle. In many cases, it you know goes slightly forward. If you think of an older bicycle, you could really see this because the forks would be bent down at the bottom. And the way that they do this with mountain bike forks is in the upper portion, the crown, they'll actually change the shape of that and it'll shift the fork forward or back. And we're seeing this trend where it's actually you know not going as far forward. The, the It's coming back closer to your bike. Um, I guess, so with that understood, and that's why this fork is significant and it's brand new, um, have have you noticed a difference running a 34 to a 32 in terms of stiffness uh, or performance in general? For sure, the stiffness. And that's where it's, with the transferring the, yeah, the lightweight technology, they did the Stepcast 32 and then the Stepcast 34, um, it's about a half pound difference, but- It's a lot, um, yeah. Significant, but for the events that I'm more focused on, it's not um, strictly a weight kind of balance. Mm-hmm. Um, certainly, feeling the confidence level is what I feel for sure. Um, um, really noticeable on the more challenging train like a BC bike race or Downeyville, just yeah. how much straighter and confident I can go into really 
technical you don't have the the flex so that you know the yeah the front wheels and it's gonna stay stay online and it's also you know an extra 20 mils the stepcast 34 is 120 mil fork versus 100 mm -hmm. and uh the new yeti sb 100 which i run was kind of designed around the the shorter offset and mm -hmm. that's what they found uh really much preferable i haven't tested back to back the traditional 51 mil offset versus a 44 but i sure know that i'm much more confident on the yeah on the the eddy uh, the fork for sure looking looking at a 32 just looks tiny now yeah um, yeah and for sure if you're a world cup xe racer you're trying to shave as much as much way as you can but i definitely think uh you'll see um adopting a few guys for sure on certain courses the benefits of a you know, a 34 stiffer fork are certainly noticeable for sure. Yeah. I, I think the same thing. I think a lot of people will, I think we'll see XC riders going to 34 mil forks. I think that it's just going to become more common. You're going to see XC forks in 34, you know, 35, depending on the manufacturer. Yeah. Um, not on all courses, but mm -hmm. certainly some there's definitely going to be a benefit. Yeah. Now you and I ride the same bike. Um, uh, that, well, not the same bike, that would be weird, but, uh, we, <laughs> we both ride the SB 100, yeah. uh, the Yeti SB 100. And I actually have a 51 millimeter offset fork on there. Okay. Um, and I've ridden it without the 51 millimeter offset. And I do prefer the shorter offset. I think it's, uh, it gives the bike a slightly more direct feeling, I guess, uh, with the steering, which I feel like, um, just goes in line, but something I've in, I've noticed, um, on my previous bike, I had, it was the Yeti ASR, and this is, you know, the SB100 is the improvement upon that bike, basically. And one big thing that I've noticed going from that bike uh, to this bike is a huge difference in chassis stiffness. Like, the frame is extremely stiff on the SB100 compared to the ASR. And actually, you can say that for most XC bikes now, they're getting stiffer in the chassis because people yeah. are riding tougher terrain that requires it. And I've actually noticed now, whereas before the RS1, which is an inverted fork that I was using, it was fine. Uh, and it was a great match for the ASR. I don't, I actually, now I'm realizing that it is a relative limitation compared to how stiff that frame is on the, on the Yeti. So like when people talk about what forks to pick, um, it's not just always across the board that like, this is the best fork, but it also does depend on how your bike behaves, right? Like the flex of the RS one with my previous bike was like perfectly in unison and it made yeah. a very cohesive unit front to back. But now I feel like the front end is just doesn't do the rest of the stiffness justice, you know? So forks are, you know, and tuning them is a whole different deal, but even just selecting them, it's going to be kind of cool to see all these XC guys, hopefully switching it up and even maybe running 120 millimeters in cross country. Yeah. I mean, That's as, good. as we've seen kind of the evolution of XC bikes and now modern geometry, you're going to, people are re realizing that a little slacker geometry makes them a lot more capable and they're able to push these quote unquote XC bikes a lot harder than. Um, you're really seeing the limitations of some of the other equipment, like the stiffness of the fork or um, realizing with a seat dropper how hard you can push a XE-ish bike. And, I mean, that's what I'm seeing with the kind of the SB100 is kind of a modern XE-ish bike and yep. how confident you can feel on, a, on an XE-ish bike. It's mostly, uh, you know, how heavy tires I am that are, are limitation, how, mm -hmm. how fast I can go on trails and some of the trails up here in Truckee, some pretty decent jump trails I'm doing for the first time on my XE ish bike, which yeah, is, right. uh, yeah. would never think about that a few years ago. It's, I find that it saves a huge amount of energy, uh, around the course, right? Like, um, they're getting these bikes now where they're more capable, but they don't weigh much more at all. I mean, my XC bike weighs 23 and a half pounds. So my yeah. SB 100, so that's pretty darn, that's pretty darn light. Like, I know it's not like a sub 20 pound weight weenie bike, but what I'm able to do with that 23 pound bike then on descents is I'm able to just relax so much more. It doesn't require yeah. so much tension. And I think that I understand the, the reticence, perhaps the XC racers feel to getting a bike with 120 millimeters of travel up front or a slightly slacker head tube angle. They feel like they need to err completely on the other side and basically make it as close to a road bike as possible. But 
I'd encourage, especially if you're coming from the roadside to actually look in the other direction and give yourself a little bit more wiggle room. It's going to help with learning things. And then as you get more capable, your bike's actually up to the task rather than you getting more capable and your bike's a yeah. limiter. I know? mean, I think that's yeah. some racers don't realize. Uh, I had a lot of success, success at the Montsino World Cup, which is really technical down, but also some of the, the hardest climbing, mm-hmm. um, some really steep, hard climbing. I wasn't necessarily a climber, but, and I wasn't necessarily going fast, much faster on the descents, but it was how much energy I was able to save as a, you know, a good technical rider. But that's where if you do have a, you know, much a setup with a bit more travel or dropper post where you're that much more relaxed or efficient, you're Mm going to be able to um, recover that much more and climb that much faster on the, on the climbs as well. Yeah. Regardless of, you know, an extra pound or two. Yeah. And I think the other thing that we're seeing now is that shock companies and then suspension companies are getting super, uh, I guess the, the designs are getting really superior to what they were and you're able to have a bike that soaks everything up in the back, but still is efficient with pedaling, which is something that's almost strange to feel having ridden, you know, hard tails, if I wanted efficiency and then full suspension, if I wanted squish. Uh, but now you can kind of have your, you know, have a cake, eat it, do the whole thing. So, um, uh, one question too that we have is about di2 and if it's useful for mountain bikes which is we actually see that question somewhat regularly like people ask like is di2 even useful and i think that what they're referring to is a lack of a front chain ring um in there i should say the need to shift your on front chain rings and just running a single ring you were running di2 yesterday i noticed um and you run it i think on all of your bikes yeah the new well most of the bikes yeah the i just got the new xtr which doesn't have a um di2 version at the moment that's right yeah um, but there's definitely some value, um, especially, and it's a product that's actually going away. A uh, great product that Fox had the IRD system with the electronic lockout. That's right. And it's, uh, the ease of use efficiency. Um, mm-hmm. fortunately the IRD is going away cause there just wasn't the market for it, mm-hmm. but it's something like that where, you know, a typical lockout lever to use multiple times on a lap, it just, uh, you don't, you think it's a little silly pushing a lever, but, uh, it adds like, up. <laughs> like the Fox RD was just a little rotary dial, which, you know, you could switch on and off in tenths of a second out of each corner. And, um, yeah. same thing with the, I mean, the DI2, uh, it's definitely the ease of use, um, I guess silly, just yeah. thumb, thumb pressure, but, uh, long races, but I mean, the biggest biggest thing I enjoy is, uh, is the maintenance aspect, um, yeah. especially living in, in Canada and the, the wet winters, um, uh, with typical cable system, you're always going to get some contaminants in there and the rear to rear shifting is going to start to drag. And yeah, that's, what's really nice. And I mean, for cross too is, I mean, yeah, you don't have to worry about cables getting bunged up and replacing them. So it's, uh, right. that's, that's one of the biggest benefits I see on the mountain bike is the maintenance and contamination of typical cables. We're going to finish this off with questions about BC bike race, but that's actually, I remember during the single track six, a stage race, I remember actually dreading having to shift down, uh, toward the end of that in stage five, when I was completely fatigued and pretty tired. Yeah. I remember just thinking like, even though it's a <clears throat> relatively easy thing to do, when uh-huh. you multiply that over how many times you needed to shift for, I don't even, you know, across those, those days, it actually did become really tough. And I remember thinking like, if I just had a little electronic button I could push, oh, I'd be so much happier. So yeah, I do think that there's a place for it. Um, uh, BC bike race, you've raced that individually how many times? And then just a, a couple of times. Yeah. It's been okay. really fun to get back the last couple of years. I've done the solo cat solo category and, mm-hmm. uh, jumped in, uh, I don't know, maybe it was 2010 with Catherine Pendrel did the, the mixed category. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and she's a fellow Olympian as well. Um, amazing Canadian cyclist. Um, she, uh, so when you guys raced as a team, cause that's actually a specific question from Daniel. He says, um, how should my teammate and I prepare for the BC bike race next year as a two person team? Um, so I guess covering this one, is there anything like specific that you feel like a team should know in relation to either, or I should say in contrast to us individual. I think it's just every teammate's going to have its strengths and weaknesses and being aware of that. I mean, it's gonna, 
um, constant conflict if you're really, I mean, competitive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you have to, you know, wait wait for your teammate, whether it be on the technical or the physical parts. And, um, I mean, yeah, just having the communication. I mean, with uh, with Catherine, she's an amazingly, uh, amazing technical rider. Yeah. And uh, power to weight, she's, you know, a really strong climber. But for me, uh, it's like the flat power sections where I had to really – kind of nurse it along but um we had i had a lot of fun racing with her mostly because we were trying to see how many guys we could chick yeah nice. uh, which was <laughs> enjoyable but yeah it's just being aware that you're gonna most likely have have different speeds and being mm. um you know allowing uh for that to happen and be okay with uh trying to help your your teammate around along where where possible i mean for me I was awfully a bit a bit stronger than Catherine, so I'd I'd go. I knew I was stronger, so I'd sometimes jet ahead to the feed zone or tell her just to keep riding, and I'd uh, grab water and and snacks, and then catch back up. Right. Um, and just figuring That's out smart. how to how to work together efficiently with your strengths and weaknesses, I guess. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. Sending one rider up the road to help with that. That's a pretty yeah. good one. Um, I guess individually. What are your, I guess we could go into BC bike race in a whole different episode, but, um, with BC bike race, what tips would you have for people? Like what bike, what sort of bike do you think is best for that sort of race? Is it a full on trail bike or a full on XC bike? Something in between? Uh, uh you definitely don't want to go, don't want to go full <laughs> XC, but yeah. it, I mean, it's still an endurance race. So, I mean, that's the thing we talked about modern XC ish bikes are, are really capable. So mm-hmm. for sure you know, it's seven days of single track and it's, it can be rough at times. So you definitely want some full suspension. Um, definitely more than just a typical XC full suspension. I think, yeah. Um, I mean, I rode the SB 100, which is a 120, 100 bike, but you know, I, I grew up on those trails, so I'm really comfortable and efficient, but I'd say, you know, definitely in the 120, 130, um, 140 range, whatever your comfort level or what your your focus is on but definitely yeah. more air volume in the tires like uh what what volume tires would you run uh or what what tires did you run what pressure and what volume i um, rode the 225 aspens okay in the low 20 pressure range except for the north van day i ran a little bit more aggressive with 235 forecaster and okay i wouldn't necessarily recommend everyone run a 225 aspen it's uh yeah fairly fast racing tire. Yeah. But, uh, definitely I think like, uh, we're in the two, three, five range gives mm-hmm. you a bit more, more air volume. I mean, I recommend, you know, uh, there's a two, three, five icon, which is, I kind of recommend, which it's kind of gives the loose stuff too, right? It's just a nice volume so you can soften it up and it, there is still, you know, a lot of, um, XC ish endurance stuff. Uh, yeah. and so you definitely want to, you don't want to run too heavy or you'll get, uh, stuck, stuck in traffic. And that's always a balance. Yeah. Uh, yeah. if you, if you run a setup, that's, you know, really capable trail bike, it, it could get a little frustrating if you get caught in the traffic and then can't ride the trails at the speed you want. But, yeah. um, yeah, I mean, coming from, well, Max's tires is, is what I run. So, uh, you know, the forecaster is kind of a good all round tire. Um, now that same, same kind of casing the two, three, five. And I think that's a good kind of compromise. I mean, for sure you can, if you're not so worried about speed and, you know, a two, three, two, three trail tire, there's lots of good options on that range, but, yeah, um, it's a good towards volume. definitely don't go full XC. It's, cool. uh, it's, uh, if you haven't ridden there, it can be certainly challenging trails for a lot of people and bumpy after a while. I assume that, yeah. And on BC bike race, you can, in terms of like a stage race nutrition and everything else, you can just uh, Google through, at, you know, the train road podcast and look for stage race and you can see different topics that we've covered on that. Uh, you know, it's in nutrition is always very individual, but it's definitely some principles you'd want to follow. Um, I think we're, we're up on time, Jeff. Um, I guess the last question that I wanted to pose to you was we were at Leadville two weeks ago and we saw four people on gravel bikes with drop bars. Do you think, so I, I, I think that both of us were under the impression that drop bars weren't allowed. I think that they told somebody in the past that he couldn't run them. Yeah. I remember Travis Brown running a freak show drop bar full suspension. 
Yeah. But I haven't looked into it, but I didn't, wasn't aware they were allowed. But certainly these days, I think drop bars would be a good option there for sure. It'd be, I, th- I think it'd be faster. Especially, I mean, yeah, with there's a bunch of bikes like the, the one I have where you can run 27.5. Uh, mountain bike tire so you could still be drop bar with a pretty that's the light. open upper or up I yeah i have the open up, up and yeah. so yeah, yeah both the up and the upper can run a 27.5 but i mean yeah even yeah a gravel bike with some 42s or 45s on it too could be from what i hear it's uh can be a bit of a road race there yeah I mean, we take some take some skill to manage that setup on the downhills but uh yeah if i was gonna do it Probably not on my list. That's probably, <laughs> if that was legal, I'd, that'd probably be a fun way for me to kind of tackle it. It's always, it's always fun kind of messing with equipment. And <laughs> I mean, I and thought tradition. about uh, trying to do the Carson City off road on my my open up too, but yeah. decided against it this year. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining us, man. We really appreciate it. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us live too and submitting all these questions that we were able to go through and, and ask you, um, if you do have any more questions for Jeff, just let us know. Uh, we can send them right over to Jeff and then maybe Jeff can get us some responses on that. Um, I guess good luck to both of us yeah. at the North star Enduro this weekend. Hopefully we, uh, us XC nerds come out alive. Uh, and thanks for, yeah, thanks for joining us, man. Uh, next big race is Oz trails off road, I guess, or. Yeah. I'm going to go over for park city point to point oh, cool. the weekend after, nice. and then the cross race here and trans Cascadia really looking forward to the four day enduro, which will be up in Oregon, Washington and yeah, Bentonville I'm excited to check that out the last round of the epic rides it's a sweet it's a sweet race man uh, you're yeah. gonna like that course so well thanks for thanks again for joining us man and uh thanks everybody for joining us we'll talk to you all next time see you later yeah.